All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And joining you from, yes, it's a beautiful sunny morning here in San Diego. The rain seems to have gone for now. Yes, we do get rain occasionally. We did get good rain yesterday, but it's only a day of it. But today I'm joined by Steve Gavatorta, who is in lovely Tampa, Florida. How are you doing, Steve? Excellent, excellent. It's lovely here too. So uh, we're the, we have the best of both worlds. Yeah, and Steve is the owner of the Steve Gavatorta Group. Uh, he's coached and trained and developed thousands of high-performing individuals and teams. He's worked at many Fortune 500 companies. And he is not only a, a coach, a public speaker, he's also an author, but he is also a certified professional behavioral and values analyst, certified Myers-Briggs practitioner, and an accredited coach and trainer for emotional intelligence. So um, before we start, uh, Steve, as you know, somebody who helps sales teams, et cetera, why, would, why did you find it important to go and get these certifications like behavioral and values analysts and Myers-Briggs and emotional intelligence? Uh, why did you feel that that was something that was important to add into your arsenal? Yeah, I think with great question, I think with whatever you do, anything, whether you're in leadership, sales, management, any type of business or personal relationship, I firmly believe uh, tr and I'm sure you'd agree with this, most of your listeners would, that trust is the most foundational element of any successful relationship. That makes sense? Right. Yeah. Uh, so in sales, if your customers don't trust you, they're not going to open up and share with you their needs. And if they're not sharing their needs, you're not going to be able to align relevant solutions. So a lot of these assessments are really about what I call building trust through effective communication or understanding different behavior styles. Uh, so whether it's DISC or Myers-Briggs or EQ, the ability to understand ourselves, our styles, be able to read and know who we're talking to is key in building that trust, building that connection. Um, if I'm a type A personality salesperson, I'm go, 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 I'm make a decision, make a decision, make a decision. And my key decision maker is much more reserved, much more introverted, much more slower in their decision making process. I can turn them off. I can mm -hmm. shut them down. And when they're turned off or shut down, uh, and we can talk about the brain functionality piece, they are no longer in a rational thinking state. They're in an emotional freeze fight or flight state. And that mm -hmm. is not where you're going to make a sale. So all these certifications have helped really help raise people's EQ about themselves, how they talk, how they communicate, how they behave, how they deal with change, risk, conflict, how they're motivated, how they make decisions for themselves first, but also how to read those behaviors and others so we can better connect, build trust, and build much deeper, uh, deeper relationships. Yeah, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And, and one of the things we were just talking about before we came on air here is Steve and I share a, a love of martial arts. Um, and it's one of the things that in, in martial arts uh, um, that people who don't practice uh, maybe don't understand uh, is that the most important thing is is to understand yourself first, right? And understand, right. Um, you know, what you're good at, what you need to work on, how you react in different situations, and then obviously how you can apply that to understanding the others that you may, um, you know, spar with or whatever. So it is very much a journey of self discovery. It's kind of similar to what you're talking about. Well, it's interesting. One of my more, one of my kickboxing instructors is the one who brought me this uh, brain functionality to light for me, the understanding of uh, limb, when you're in your limbic state of mind versus when you're in your cortex state of mind and how to differentiate the two and how to uh, keep yourself in that rational state, so to speak. So a lot of what I learned through a martial arts coach, I use in my business as well too. And it's mm -hmm. kind of a underpinning of my, my book in defense of adversity too. So great yeah, stuff. So yeah, so let's talk about those two um, parts of the brain, because I think that's that would be fascinating for people. So um, explain a little bit more about the, the two parts of the brain and how they operate and how you need to control them. Yeah, there's two important parts of our brain. Uh, the first being our limbic system. That is the, our emotional brain. That's the, our, our, the, what we're born with. Uh, when we are functioning in that rash, uh, the limbic part of our brain, our response to an adverse situation is going to be strictly emotional, freeze, fight, or flight. Adrenaline is going to start rushing. We're not going to be thinking rationally. And again, our response is solely going to be emotional. Um, that was great when we were cavemen and a, you know, a dinosaur was coming and we would run away. You know, we'd, we'd be, we would know what to do. Or when we're a baby and we want something, we cry. It served mm. its purpose back then, but we've evolved 
since the cave men and women days, and we've evolved as, as since we were babies. So we that's one part of the brain. The, the part of the brain that that grows and evolves through learnings, experience, uh, teachings is the cortex part of the brain. That's called our rational brain. That's where reason, reason, rational thinking, problem solving, are, are, that's where that's, that's the part of the brain that's all done. So the whole point of uh, that limbic system versus cortex is in any situation, but especially uh, something stressful, adverse related, change, risk taking, what, this, what we're going through in this crazy world today, mm -hmm. um, you wanna function in that rational part of your brain, the cortex, you wanna think rationally and clearly not in that emotional part. When you're in freeze, fight, or flight, you're no longer productive. So that's the important part of that, to avoid, to create what I, what I call uh, stopping the transfer of authority from the cortex to the limbic system. Does that make sense? If no, I'm that makes complete. Yeah, if I'm uh, operating that rational part of my brain, I want to mm -hmm. stay there this, when, when adversity strikes, because then I'm going to be able to function, think clearly, uh, function rationally. But if I slip into that limbic part of my brain, freeze, fight, or flight, um, I'm not going to be func uh, functioning on my 100% cylinders as it is, but also it's not easy to get out of that right yeah. away. Mm -hmm. I'm mad. I can't get on mad in a second. If I'm freezing, I can't unfreeze in a second. So it's imperative to not let yourself fall into that because you're no longer productive. So. Yeah, and and the and the problem with that too is that it just it's not just a mental reaction, right? I mean, it's a physical and physical and physiological one as well, right? So if you get in, if you get, if you get, uh, um, you know, mad or you freeze or you get really, um, you know, uh, unsure or whatever in that moment, and these are things, and let's face it, I mean, these are things that happen constantly in in selling situations, yeah. right? Um, where you maybe get a curveball thrown at you or something triggers you or you get an adversarial you know, response or whatever, it's very easy to um, react emotionally, right? Exactly. And then, as you say, it's really hard to come back from that because it's not instantaneous. You can't sort of, when you get shocked into something, you can't unshock yourself immediately. That's why I'm such a proponent and why I do what I do in training and developing mm -hmm. people, coaching people, because without those fundamental skills, we may more easily fall into that limbic state. I see it all the time with uh, handling of objections in a sales call. Mm -hmm. You know, when people do not how to know how to handle an objection, they fall into that limbic state of freeze, fight, or flight. The adrenaline starts rushing to your point. You lose your motor skills. You're no longer functioning at full capacity. So you'll see that a uh, customer gives an objection. The person either punches back right away and gets defensive or shuts down, doesn't know how to answer that because they don't know the skills. When you teach those skills, that person now knows they have options. I don't have to panic or I don't have to bite back right away. I can take my time to think clearly about this and handle uh, that objection based on what I learned in Steve's workshop, three Fs or whatever other type of handling objection uh, technique I was taught. Those skills and fundamentals prepare you for those adverse times or those times that aren't as, uh, as uh, positive, let's say. And, and it keeps us in that rational state. Yeah, and, and part of it is obviously, you know, to recognize when those occur and to recognize your own triggers. Yeah. So you have um, solution alignment selling is, is, is your program. What are some of the key components of that and how does this, uh, uh, how does this uh, behavioral uh, analysis uh, part play into it? Yeah, again, if what I say, too, I think having fundamentals in, in selling is more important now than ever. I always say we're in a mm -hmm. fast-paced, yep. high-tech, ever-evolving world. Um, if we can't, the customers, uh, key decision-makers are busier, busier than ever. The key is how do we cut through the clutter, get their attention, get them to listen, get them to remember us, and get them to actually act. It's tougher now more than ever. I remember in the past, you didn't get back with them in you know the day. Mm -hmm. That would be difficult. You know, now you have to get sure. back from life like that. So they they have a lot on their plate. So the key is cutting through the clutter, getting their attention, getting them to respond and react. So I'm I really go for the solution based or, or consultative based approach. Is really dig deep, understand customer needs, um, things they're dealing with, problems they're trying to solve, and how do you build a relevant solution for those uh, for those programs. It's not about yeah, presentation is not about showing up and throwing up, talking about mm -hmm. my product, talking about my service. It's really about driving a dialogue, really understanding your customers' needs, then finding those relevant solutions. 
sounds easier than it is. Most people probably think I do that already, but I dare I mm. gather 90% of salespeople out there now are used car salesmen. And I don't mean that literally. I'm just saying they show up and throw up. They go in and try to start talking about their pro- their their product or service without un- uncovering those needs. So the key thing I talk about is really the first step of uh, solution alignment selling is discovery phase. And there's two parts of that. One is the human dynamic. That's just what we talked about. Knowing your own style, reading who you're communicating with can help you close that communication gap, build trust so that customer opens up and shares with you. So I Mm -hmm. use a variety of assessments, whether it's DISC or Myers-Briggs or bar on EQ to help people understand themselves first. Am I that type A personality? And who am I dealing with? That person is not. How do I have to adapt my style to better communicate with them, to better sell them, to better present to them? Because once again, if, I, if I'm not building trust, if I'm, I'm shutting them down, they're not going to open mm-hmm. up and share. So the first step of that is really that discovery phase human dynamic, who are the key decision makers, what are their styles, and how can I build trust with them? Then once you build trust, it's about really driving dialogue and uncovering their need. What's keeping them up at night? And my whole premise is if you can solve for what's keeping your customer up at night, you're going to be viewed as a consultant rather than a vendor. And I really like to distinguish, you know, when you're viewed as a vendor, you're viewed as selling a commodity, yep. you're viewed for price, and you're constantly going to be, get viewed, you're mm-hmm. beat up on price. But when you're viewed as a consultant, you're viewed for the value you bring, you're viewed for the solutions you provide. And then you are viewed differently. And not saying mm-hmm. price goes away, but it becomes less relevant because your customer views you for the value you bring versus yeah. the price. And obviously, and it's important for you to understand that you you start as a vendor. You um unless unless maybe you know you've been brokered in by somebody or you know you've you've been referred in, maybe you're a little further down. But I think uh, going back to what you're saying about is understanding uh the other person. And I think that's important because sometimes it's like if you just have one mode of how you communicate, right? Maybe you're an extremely relational person, right? Yeah. If you get a very analytical person on the other end, um, that doesn't fly with them. They're not interested generally right. in all the all the banter and small talk. That's right. They want to get to the facts. Vice versa, you know, if you're if you're if you have a very relational person and you get too analytical immediately, um, they'll be like, huh. Exactly. This, this person is a little cold. So, I mean, just really understanding who you're talking to and, and not using one mode of communication. And I think that's a trap that a lot of people fall into. You, you, you develop a comfortable way of communicating that works for you. And the operative term there is it works for exactly. you. Exactly. Well, you know, and I do a lot around presentation skills, uh, around consultant selling, customer-based presentation skills, Aligning not only to the uh, to the needs of that respective customer, what things what things are they facing? How can I help them grow their business or solve a problem? But also that human dynamic piece. And what I find in these presentation skills workshops are, people tend to build presentations relevant to how they like to receive them. Mm-hmm. So to your point, if I'm that relationship builder person, I'm going to build a deck or I'm going to present a deck in a manner that's that way, very interactive, very not heavy with details and data and content, if I'm presenting to that in disk terms, a high C or highly analytical person, that's not going to be enough data for them. So not only do people forget Mm -hmm. about style dynamics, but how they're presenting out, what is the content within that presentation? So several things I find out in these workshops are number one, again, we're not building a deck relevant to the style that he's decision maker, number one. Number two, we're not building a deck relevant to solving a problem that that customer's facing. We're building a deck to sell our stuff, which ultimately we want to do. Mm-hmm. You want to underpin that under with, with the whole point that this recommendation I'm making today is here to solve a problem. And I always say, if you can help a business drive top line sales or cash flow, profitability, in some sort of incrementality, where that's market share growth, register ring, attachment rate, you're going to be a success in our eyes because those three fundamentals are what's desired in any business. Help me grow my cash flow top line. Help me be profitable and help me grow my business as well, too. So how does my product line align to solving one, two, or all three of those things? And I think one of the things that uh, it's really important too is that, uh, and you hear this a lot, is like we have certain biases, right? You know, where you often hear like, 
you know, what's the prospect like? And they say, oh, they're great. They're, you know, they're really chatty. They're really open and all of that. Or they say, uh, you know, they're quiet. They're kind of, they don't, they don't give a lot away or they're very, un- and we, we attribute, you know, we give negative attributes to those. And all the only one we praise is we say, oh, it's great. You know, they're really open. So okay. we, we go into it with a certain bias built in, which is not okay. a good thing, right? No doubt. Well, again, and I'll say this, when someone doesn't trust you, you're not going to see their full self or their full style, whether it's disc terms or Myers-Briggs. So if I'm engaging with a new buyer and here, and this has happened in my past life, uh, my past, my last job in corporate America was with Kodak. I was calling on a mm-hmm. very large food retailer in New Jersey, very difficult, very tough. And they didn't trust me because I just took the account over. They didn't trust Kodak right. uh, because of the previous rep. So all I saw in disc terms was a dominant style, a sensor type to the point, impatient, yelling, screaming, swear words, you know, and that's because they didn't trust me. After I uh, showed some success, after they started trusting me, after I started solving some of their problems, there was more to that D style from that buyer. There was more of a personal style. Mm-hmm. Uh, we ended up golfing together. I learned he had wife, kids, was a, actually a great family man. And a relationship that was very difficult when I first took that account over ended up to be being very positive when I left the organization. I still will call that, this is 16 years ago, I will still call that buyer one time a year just to check in on him, a guy I couldn't stand before. But my point is he didn't trust me, hence I didn't see the full dynamic of mm-hmm. his. He was holding th- things close to the vest. He wasn't sharing his cards. It's all about trust. If I get my customers trusting me, then they're going to open up and share and we're going to have dialogue. And now when we have dialogue, am I going to be able to properly solve their problems with my product or service? Yeah. So basically you earned it. I mean, and that's the thing is I, I think sometimes people think that if I call you up and I'm all nice and friendly and I'm uh, all of this stuff that I, you should reciprocate, but I, I haven't earned that yet. Exactly. Exactly. And to your point earlier, a lot of people think a great relationship means we go out to lunch. I know about your wife, kids and family. Maybe in the day that was, but with technology and and in many businesses, especially my old world of consumer packaged goods, data, research, uh, consumer data, uh, loyalty card data is much deeper and and more, uh, more pronounced now. So the need for that analytic buyer, that need for that analytic key decision maker and, and analytic salesperson has rised immensely. So a good relationship doesn't necessarily mean I know everything about your wife, kids, and family. Yeah. A good relationship could mean I'm helping you beat your competition. I'm helping you keep your competition you know, at bay. I am giving you good facts and data for you to make a relevant decision so you feel comfortable with. Relationships vary depending on what we talk about, that style. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I know for myself as as a buyer, if if everything is going well and and whoever I've bought from is delivering what I need, you'll actually hear less and less from me. Absolutely. So it's 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 the opposite. It's like uh, you know, and I don't need the check ins. I don't need believe you'll hear from me if there's a problem. But if everything is going really well, you won't really hear. Well, the dialogue will change too. You know, the dialogue will be. Um, I need this. I need that. Can you get me this? You have to do yeah. this. Why aren't you doing that? To more. Hey, can we? Can you come in? Can we have a talk? Can we yeah. talk the numbers? Can we talk this? And, and that's a that's a change in dynamic too. That that mm-hmm. aggressive, angry approach to you versus that collaborative approach as well too. So that will drive that. And that shop rate situation I taught, or that that was the retailer shop rate. I don't know if I mentioned that or not, but uh, that was that situation as well too. Um, originally it was a dictatorial relationship. Tell me what I needed to do, what I should do, and it turned into something. Hey, can you help us? Can you work yeah. with us? Huge flip flop in the dynamic. So, and, that, yeah. and that's what I teach my cl- uh, customers today. And I deal with as a uh, in selling my capabilities to my clients as well too. So, yeah, and and then and the other part of it is then when problems do arise, it's more likely. That, like I said, from my point of view, uh, when I'm working with uh, with with somebody who's providing a service to me and everything is going well and they've done everything, if a problem comes up, I'll be like. You know, hey, hey, listen, Steve, there's there's a problem here. Can you fix it? Instead of like, oh, what's going on here? This is terrible. I'm yeah. just like, yeah, I know, I know it's a, I know it's an issue. It cropped up. I know, no, no, I trust you that you'll fix it quickly and let me know. And going back to that limbic system and cortex thing, it, once again, if I don't have that trust, and you're not trusting me, you're not 
Yeah. You may come at that, that key decision maker, that buyer or that customer may come at me in that, with that angry fight phase. But yeah. if they trust me, they know Steve is a partner with us. Steve is a consultant trying to help us. They're going to come at me more rational. So that's where the brain functionality piece comes in that sales dynamic. If I'm turning off a key decision maker, they could, I could put them in that limbic system state of freeze, fire, or flight. They're not productive anymore. So the more they trust me, the more that I can help them stay in a rational buying decision, decision making uh, capability, the more success I'm going to have in trying to sell them my product or service as well, too. Yeah, absolutely. All right, Steve. Well, we're coming up against the end of our time. This has been fantastic. Yeah. Uh, all of Steve's information will be in his contributor bio, links to his website, his programs, his books, everything you, you need to find out more. And I think this is fascinating stuff. But before we go anyway, Steve, just tell people a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, uh, just a little bit of background. I spent, uh, I'm, I'm a guy that who's, as they say, carried the bag, led people, managed people. I, I spent 21 years in corporate America, really a cross-functional array of, uh, of, uh, of uh, responsibilities. I left uh, corporate America cold turkey and started my business. And what I really do is work with my clients to understand their needs and build custom-based training, development, coaching uh, programs for their respective needs. So uh, it could be sales-oriented, leadership-oriented, uh, change management, uh, hiring and retaining, high-impact team, presentation skills. It really depends on the issues my customers facing. And what I do is try to practice what I preach go into my customers, understand their needs, and build custom-based programs for those needs. I don't do anything vanilla. Some skill sets um, and, and processes may be similar across different clients and industry, but where I really create my point of differentiation is understanding their needs and building, re building relevant programs or solutions to meet those respective needs. So my goal is to help my clients drive top-line sales, cash flow, profitability, and incrementality through growth. So. Yeah, and who doesn't need that? And then, yeah, and I would, uh, I would highly encourage uh, people to check out what Steve does. I think in in this in this day and age, uh, yeah, people are busy. They're hard to get to. Actually, I don't. Th I think they're less busy than they think. I think they're more uh, more distracted. Actually, that's my right. thing. Um, but they're also um, putting up more barriers, um, less attention span, all of that. So anything you can do to give yourself an edge. So I would uh, encourage you to check out what Steve does. And that's what I try to do. Just as a company tries to differentiate their brand for their customers, you can be a point of differentiation as a consultant or a solution provider versus your customer. Again, the key takeaway is do not be a vendor selling a commodity getting beat up on price. Be viewed as a consultant or a solution provider, bringing value to your customer. And then price, again, doesn't go away in total, but it becomes significantly less relevant. So, Yeah, no, and I think that's a really important point to end on because generally speaking today, uh, you are viewed as a commodity. Whether you like it or not, it doesn't matter how great and how differentiated your product is, it's still viewed as a commodity. Yeah. You as the salesperson are the only thing that can differentiate you, exactly. at least in the exactly. initial stages. Exactly. All right, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline and CRM. Thanks again to Steve Gavitorta for coming on today. And I will see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Yeah.